All right, so this morning we're going to continue on with the Bible study that we started a few weeks ago. Uh, we're going through the book of 1 John. So we're, here we are in 1 John chapter 4. We'll go through verse by verse. And again, this gives you a taste of what we do on Wednesday nights. Uh, every week on Wednesday night we do Bible study uh, just like this. So let's dig into the chapter here. Verse number 1, 1 John chapter 4, the Bible reads, Beloved, believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So we have an admonition here beginning in verse 1 that tells us, look, you need to try the spirits. And, you know, when I first got saved, back when I was, what, 19 years old, I kind of, I had this view of Christianity, of Christianity just being this, this big, generic Christianity, right? Which still, I mean, well, all of us have this view, right? There's this, this reference to Christianity at large, and Christianity can just encompass all denominations, all different types of people, right? Anyone who just claims to be a Christian, that's just like Christianity. And when I first got saved, it was obviously an enlightening or illumination and an understanding of the gospel when I finally put my trust in Jesus Christ. Like, I, it was something that uh, you know, I got to a low point in my life and I was kind of seeking and I wanted to know the truth and I, and I didn't want to just assume that, that Christianity was true because I was brought up that way. I really wanted to know what is the truth, who is God, what's right, what's wrong. And then the, the, the day I got saved, you know, obviously I called on the Lord, I trusted Jesus to be my Savior, and without having someone, like unfortunately I didn't have the benefit of having a soul winner right there to, to, to really make it really clear and obvious, but I still came to the understanding through seeds that had been planted and the Word of God had been planted in my heart, the understanding of Christ being the Savior and I just need to trust Him and believe on Him to save me, right? So I knew, I knew that much. I had to in order to call on the Lord and then get saved. But now after that point, the way that I viewed it was like, I kind of felt like, oh, I felt like I was kind of dumb. These, all these people in Christianity already knew what I had just come to accept and, and, and understand and believe. And I just thought that like, I was the weird one and they all already knew it, right? And, and then, no, okay, no, hey, now, now I'm a believer. Now I'm part of the club. Now I'm a Christian like all of these other people. And that was my thought. And, and you know, there's, there's, it, it's, it was not accurate, but without having much knowledge as a baby, as a spiritual baby that was just born again, you know, it's, it's what I thought. So, and, and it, honestly, it wasn't until much later when I started to be, uh, introduced with, with more teachings and doctrines and, and scripture and just, you know, like learning a little bit more where I started to see some differences and started to see that like, okay, these, because before I didn't really care that much. I didn't even know what the differences were. I mean, you could say you're Church of Christ, you could say you're Assemblies of God, you could say you're Pentecostal, you could say you're Baptist, you could say you're Lutheran, you could say, you know, I grew up Presbyterian, and to me it was just kind of like, I knew there were differences, but what they were didn't really matter that much to me. The only thing that really stood out to me was Catholicism, just because I had some friends that were Catholic, so we went to some of their services, and it was really different than just about everything, right? Even even my Catholic light service of Presbyterian was pretty significantly different than what I'd seen in the Catholic church service. So like, I was like, okay, well, yeah, that's really weird and off, but I didn't understand all these differences, right? And, and honestly, I still didn't really understand the differences until I went to a church that went soul winning, until I went to a church where we went out and preached the gospel to people. And that's really when my eyes started to open up a lot more about what people actually believe. And, and I started to see the differences in the gospel that is taught and believed among these various denominations. 
Because for the longest time, I just thought that, hey, everybody's saved. Okay, yeah, they argue and they have differences about this and that and everything. And I didn't realize the importance of it until you actually start talking to people. Because again, you can, you know, anyone who's going to call themselves Christian or Christianity at large, if you just asked one question and just said, hey, are you a Christian? They would answer, yes. Right? And if you just left it at that and didn't ever dig any deeper, then you're just going to have that same mindset of going, like, yeah, I mean, they're Christian. Like, I'm a Christian. They're a Christian. We're all Christians, right? Wouldn't you like to be a Christian too? <laughs> Sorry. But when you start asking more pointed questions and just kind of getting to the heart of the matter and seeing, you're, you're going to realize that, uh, like, you know, people who start to teach, like, well, you know, you believe in eternal security. We believe you could lose your salvation. But, you know, we, we're all just Christians. We all believe in Jesus. Hold on a second there now. Because now you're starting to get into an area of, uh, that's of extreme importance and literally boils down to is your faith in Christ alone for your salvation or is it not? Because if something else is going to take you away from Christ, then you're going to have to do something other than just believe. Right? If you're able to lose your salvation because you commit some sin or you do something else in your life, well, then apparently it's not just faith in Christ that saves you. You also have to not do these other things that are going to make you lose that salvation, right? And, and there's so many other things. I'm not going to go on and on down the list for all these different denominations, all the various things that they believe. You, well, you got to be baptized to be saved. You start adding all these other works to it. They're not the same. So we need to be able to have discernment and grow and learn. And just because someone says they're a Christian or just because someone says they're saved doesn't mean that they actually are, which is why we need to try the spirits. Now, in this context, this isn't just talking about, like I brought up soul winning and I brought up just other people who claim to be believers. But this isn't talking about you know, judging every single person who says they're saved. Obviously, we should be able to do that because we want to preach the gospel to them. But what this is referring to are the false prophets, and it's extremely important for us to identify them because if you're going to learn from someone and listen to someone and have them instruct you in doctrine and the ways of God and teach the Bible to you, you need to be able to, to, to try the spirits and see whether or not that really is of God. Because we don't want to be receiving a bunch of stuff from someone who's not saved, from some false prophet for someone who's going to say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh yeah, I believe the Bible. Oh yeah, I'm saved. Oh yeah, I believe these things. But they really don't. Amen. Or they're just lost. Right? If the blind lead the blind, then both fall into the ditch. Right? We don't want to follow some spiritually blind person that can't discern the word of God because the Bible says that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. They're spiritually discerned. You need to have the Holy Spirit of God to guide you and to teach you into all, uh, guide you in all t uh, uh, truth and wisdom and knowledge and, and, and to get you to understand these things. And if we're going to listen to a prophet, listen to a teacher, hey, they better, they better be saved, right? That's like step number one. So we need to try the spirits whether or not they actually are of God because many people will make the claim that they're of God, but we need to, we need to test it. If it's a try them, it means you're testing it. Okay, we're going we're gonna to figure out, is this of God? And the Bible gives us, turn, keep your place here in 1 John. Of course, we're coming back here. But I want to take a little bit of time during this study to, to and turn if you to Matthew 7, if I didn't say that right, turn to Matthew 7. We're going to look at a few different references in Scripture that can help us to identify the false prophets. So there's a few places where this is brought up. And, and of course, 1 John 4 is going to continue and give us some more information. We'll get into that. But I want to start by looking at some other places first, and then we'll come back to uh, the context of 1 John 4 and what it says about trying those spirits, right? But we're going to these other places just so you understand that it's, it's a comprehensive study. It's not just this one thing is going to tell you, right? Like, like this is a piece of it in 1 John 4. And it's a very good piece and it's truthful, it's, it's right. But there's also other ways to help identify and try the spirits in addition to what's taught in 1 John chapter 4, right? So we're going to see Jesus teaches about this and many people teach about this, you know, there's this warning, hey, watch out for false prophets. It's a big deal because there's a lot of false prophets out there and we need to be aware of them. So Matthew chapter 7, 
And this is, the, I, I, you know, I turn here first because this is so widely misused, misapplied as a passage. As I just mentioned, we're not talking about identifying individual believers, like who's a believer or not a believer based on this. This is identifying a false prophet. And I hope we can all understand the differences between someone who just maybe attends a church or even doesn't attend a church and just has their own belief versus a teacher of the word, a prophet, a pastor, a preacher, a bishop, whatever you want to call them, that's going to be someone who is, should be well-knowledged, well-versed, not just your average layman, but someone who's really invested a lot of time and is now going to be teaching and, and instructing other people. That is a different type of person than your average just person on the street, right? So we need to try the spirits. We need to find the false prophets because we don't want to be sitting under their teaching and their instruction. And Jesus starts off in Matthew 7, verse 15, by saying, beware of false prophets. So this begins this context of false prophets. He says, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So the, the, these false prophets will have the appearance of being good, of being godly, of being a sheep, right? Of being one of God's children. They're going to put on that appearance for you. But in fact, inwardly, they're actually very wicked. And I would say this, that the false prophets are out to deceive, which is another distinction, even above that of just someone who is a teacher. This is going to go to the level of someone who is aware of what they're doing and is a wolf. So the false prophet that's referenced in Scripture is talking about someone who, because there are people who, in their own sincerity and ignorance, may be a teacher of the scripture or of the Bible, right? And, and, and falsely, right? So on the one hand, you could say, oh, they're a false prophet because they're teaching a false gospel. But if they don't know any better, it's possible for them to be doing so ignorantly in unbelief until they'd come to the truth of the knowledge of the gospel and then they could still get saved. Whereas the type of person being described here by Jesus is the false prophet who is a wolf inwardly. It's like a child of the devil, okay? Someone who is, uh, and that's what First uh, Peter chapter two. This is what or Second Peter chapter two. Jude all talk about this type of person as the false prophet, right? And this is this is specifically who we're talking about. So it is important, obviously, to understand if someone's a teacher and is not teaching the right things and is not saved. And even more important to identify the wolf to identify the false prophet that is a bad person, the person that wants to make merchandise of you, the person that wants to use you, the person that doesn't care about you at all and only cares about themselves and is bent on destruction. So this is how we identify those wicked people that are in position. And, you know, and some of these guys, you don't even have to, like, like, obviously, the Bible's going to tell us that we can, we can use these methods to, to find out those people. But some of these people, I think, are pretty obvious. Amen. Right? The most obvious ones are going to be, like, the weirdo cult leaders. Yeah. Right? The Jim Joneses, the, the really bizarre people out there. They don't care about their, you know, they're these perverts. They're these people that only care about themselves. They care about their power. They care about all this other stuff. Right? Like, like. I would say that's extremely obvious for the vast majority of people. Obviously, they'd still get people sucked into their cults. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't even know about them. But, but those are kind of more, out there, out, more obvious. And I would say also the people that are um, like the Joel Osteens of the world. That's just the, the like the, I, I call him like a used car salesman type of a guy. The guy that's just always just telling you everything everything is great all the time for some people those are a little bit harder to spot because obviously they get like really big followings but even i mean i would say even as unsaved i look at people like that going like really like they just it just seems more obvious that they're just out to swindle people 
They just care about your money, right? And, and you can spot those things. But Jesus gives us a way here to identify the, the, those that are um, in a really good way, obviously, um, on, on how to identify who are these wolves that are ravening wolves uh, inwardly, but outwardly they're, they're going to try to look like they're good people. Look at verse 16. The Bible says, you shall know them by their fruits. And right, right away, I mean, people say, oh, you're known by your fruits, you're known by your fruits. And people want to apply this to, is someone saved or not saved? And then they're going to say, well, are you keeping the commandments? Are you doing this or doing that? And start applying all this stuff to knowing people by their fruits. But is that really what this is teaching here? First of all, you're looking for ravening wolves. Is every unsaved person a ravening wolf? I would say not. I would say not. I, I would say that every unsaved person is not someone who's putting on sheep's clothing as a disguise to trick other people into thinking that there's something that they're not. And secretly, they're a wolf. I don't think that's every unsaved person. I think most unsaved people are relatively honest. Now, they may be deceived. They may be wrong. They may think something different. But they're not just wearing this cloak of trying to pretend to be someone that they're not. And they're secretly a wolf. Okay? This is a wicked person. This is a false prophet. This is a reprobate. So he says, you shall know them by their fruits. And then it goes on to explain, hey, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And it's just a real simple illustration here explaining that, like, look, whatever the tree is, it could only bring forth after its kind, at whatever it, like, an apple tree produces apples all the time. Amen. And it doesn't produce anything else, and it's not going to produce thorns and, and, and thistles and all these other things that are just, like, bad. It's going to produce what it is, right? It's, it's so, so whatever it, it actually is, oranges, bananas, apples, whatever, that's what it's going to produce. And it can't produce anything different. And, and similarly, something that's a weed, something that's no good, will never turn and then start producing good things. It just, it doesn't happen, right? So what he's saying is, in the same manner, in the same way, right? Hey, if someone is part of the vine of Jesus, as it explains later in the book of John, Jesus is going to, you know, being tied into Christ is going to bring forth that good fruit because you're, you're in Christ. But those that are not in Christ can't bring forth good fruit. So clearly this is going to be a big distinction because no matter how, no matter how good the sheep's clothing is, they could never bring forth good fruit. They will never be able to yield good fruit. So they could, they could trick a lot of people with their words and deceive people and kind of string people along. But they themselves will not have good fruit. Now, one of the ways they're going to deceive people is by trying to do good things outwardly. Right? Now, in their heart, they're not good. But I would say the same way that Judas Iscariot was able to deceive people. He was part of Jesus' ministry. He went out and did the things that they did. He was the treasurer and like, oh yeah, I'm sure he was probably really good at his job on the outside of, of making sure things got done. But he was also a thief, right? As we find out later in, in, the, in the Bible, like, oh yeah, he's a thief. He didn't care about the poor. He just wanted to pocket some of that money. But no one else knew that. Right? He's, he's wearing his sheep's clothing. But inwardly, he's really wicked. So you can't look at the fact like, oh, Judas, I mean, he volunteers to do these jobs. What a great guy. I mean, he, he decided just to handle to be the treasurer. And hell, wasn't that great? I mean, he, he sacrificed his own time to, to do this extra work and stuff. I was like, no, he's, he's a thief. But, and I'm sure he was probably friendly and nice to people. Right? And all the other things that would go along with making himself look like all the rest of the disciples. But he wasn't one. And so when Jesus is done explaining here, obviously you know, a corrupt tree can't bring forth good fruit. He says, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Well, there's one thing specifically 
that false prophets can't bring forth because they could look like they're doing good, right? They can, they can physically do things outwardly that other people do to look like them, right? And, and, and so maybe they, they aren't going to drink or smoke or, you know, there's, there's different commandments you can say like, oh, look, they're living a clean lifestyle. You don't have to be saved in order to not do those sins, right? I mean, don't we know unsaved people that maybe have never drank, never smoked, never commit fornication, they got married, they lived a life that we would look at and say that's a clean life. But they're just unsaved. It's totally possible, right? So we can't look at those things to determine is this a false prophet, right? Because unsaved people could do the same things in that regard. But there is something we can look at that is a reproduction, which is what's talking about fruits. You're reproducing after your kind. So the, the type of followers, a type of believers, a type of people that you have claimed to have led to Christ is going to identify whether or not you're a, a false prophet, right? Because a, a prophet is a tree. And the tree is going to bring forth fruit. Now, not every, you know, the, the fruit being someone who is a convert, but not every convert becomes a tree, right? I mean, just like naturally, hey, we have fruit trees and fruit falls to the ground and they have seeds in them, right? The seed is good. It came from a good tree. It, 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 it is the fruit that it is, but not all of that will in turn then die, go into the ground, and come forth as a tree to also bring forth more fruit. Many of them will just pass away, and they're done. They didn't really bring forth anything, right? So, but the tree is representative of a prophet, and a good tree is going to bring forth good fruit. Bad tree, uh, bad fruit only, always. So, you could look at the ministry. You can look at who, like, what's the work being done? Talk to the people, talk to the church, go, you'll get a feel for what's going on there. I mean, if someone were to come in here and, and just take us, take a poll and start talking to people and questioning their salvation and stuff, I have no problem. I have no problem to go talk to anyone. And, and here's what's important about that too. It's not that I had to lead every single person here to Christ in order for you to test the fruit. When you have a whole bunch of saved people, you know, you've got the Spirit of God. You're going to be able to, you know, someone should be able to identify if there's like, oh man, Pastor Burns, he's a false prophet. Right? And those of you that go soul winning with me, we go, there are people that I've gotten saved and have come in here and gotten baptized and have saved, you know, like that, that is true. But everyone here is going to be a witness to that and you could test the ministry, you could test the results, you could see what's happening, you can see the overall fruit of the church that's, that's coming forward, right, to be able to identify that. And this is why it's also, uh, I also encourage people to be careful when you receive teaching from people from the past where you can't really do a good job necessarily of, of testing the fruit. So, depending on how far back you go, right? Some people pass away, you could still see the results of their fruit maybe, you know, going forward. But the farther you go back, the harder it's going to be to determine, like, was this guy even saved or not? So um, Jesus gives us this admonition to, to be able to identify false prophets uh, this way. T turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 14. And since there are, uh, there are a lot of passages, we're not, we're not going through an exhaustive list this morning because we're going to get through the rest of 1 John chapter 4. But I did want to cover this pretty thoroughly just to give the understanding here of uh, the many false prophets going out. Jeremiah 14, we're just going to read this passage real quickly, uh, verses 10 through 15, to see that false prophets have a tendency to preach the positive only messages. And we see an example of that here in Jeremiah chapter 14. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, 
Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. So God is speaking to Jeremiah and he says, Look, this people is wicked. This people, as we saw in verse 15, they love to wander. They don't refrain their feet. They get off into all manner of, of sin and iniquity and mischief. And he's like, look, I'm not going to accept them. And I'm going to remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Like, I'm going to come and judge them and I'm going to come and punish them. That's the actual word of the Lord. Hey, you're, you're walking off into sin and doing all these wicked things. God's going to judge. And, and that's what needs to be preached. God's a God of judgment. We, we ought to fear the Lord. Right. And when people get too comfortable in their life, if they're, especially in a very sinful life, you know, that's when God is going to come and lay down the law, so to speak. And he even tells Jeremiah, don't pray for the good of this people. Right. Like, don't even pray. You think like, Wow. I mean, how bad do things have to be where God's going to say, like, don't even pray anything. Don't even ask me for anything for the good for this people. And this is something that a lot of people like to say because it sounds real good. Right. Oh, let's just God bless America. God, pray, you know, bless this person. God bless that person. Bless, 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 bless. You shouldn't just be willy nilly, you know, wishing God's blessing and goodness on everybody on everybody because there are some people where God's going to be like look don't pray for this people for their good because they're just extremely wicked now we can pray for good in the sense of like well help them to see the truth of the gospel help them to get saved if they're not saved help them to to come to their senses if they are saved and to you know get right with God but it's not going to be good in the sense of oh yeah you know Fill their, their storehouses with plenty and, and make them to prosper and bless them in that regard, right? So that's, that's what God doesn't want happening here. And he says this, look, when they fast, I'm not going to hear their cry. When they offer burnt offering and oblation, I'm not going to accept them. So this is a people that have a semblance of their religion. They're doing these different things, but he's like, I'm not going to accept any of it. Why? Because you can't just live this real wicked life and expect just... God to be happy with you and pleased with you just because you showed up to church and you gave an offering or something, right? This is, this is similar to, I'm going to live really wickedly all throughout the week, but now I'm going to show up to church and I'm going to put some money in the offering plate and then I'm just going to pretend like I'm good with God and I'm going to keep just living a wicked life. And God's saying, no, I don't accept that. I don't accept that. You give me your little work here. You give me your prayer. I'm not going to hear you. He says, I'm going to consume them by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence. And then Jeremiah responds saying, look, but all the prophets are saying, you're not going to see the sword. Nothing bad's going to happen to you. God's blessing you. You're doing good, right? You're not going to have famine. You're not going to have war, but you have peace. Verse 14, then the Lord said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. They're teaching falsely, right? false prophets. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. See, I'm going to judge them out of their own words. Like there's all these things that they're saying aren't going to happen. They are going to die by those very things that they say aren't going to happen. Just to show that, yeah, these guys are not of God. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 4. But you notice it's, it's the people that, and you could get this, it's, it's kind of a theme 
especially in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Jeremiah, those, those, those prophets are always saying the opposite of what God was saying. Because <laughs> the message from the Lord was not a good one during Jeremiah's day. Because the people were really wicked at that point, as right before and during their captivity, right? Jeremiah was kind of that last prophet to preach to the people, to the nation, before they were just taken captive. So he's there trying to warn them, trying to guide them. And, and with each error and with each mistake and with all their sin, he's saying, okay, look, you didn't listen here, but now listen here. Now do this. And now they say, don't go into Egypt, stay here. And do, you know, all these other things. And they just, every single time there was false prophets or people saying the wrong thing every single time. And the people did the wrong thing every single time, which is ultimately they ended up then just going into captivity and it was real bad for them. So, um, yeah, you need to be able to try the spirits and try the pro and, and you know, at, at the first time that those all those false prophets failed in Jeremiah, the people should have been like, dude, you told us like there was going to be no sword and famine. So why are you going to listen to them again? Like they're the ones preaching the prosperity and the peace and everything's good. And then when it's not good, it's like, but you said that God said it was good. If, if, if you have someone telling you this is what God said and then that doesn't come to pass, that's not of God. Amen. And I would say, then don't stop listening to that person because they clearly are not getting their information from the Lord. And, and this is why I'm never going to say, hey, you know what God told me? You know, God's telling me this and God's telling me that and God wants you to, you know. I don't use that language. Because what I'm going to do is say, hey, God wants you to do this because of what this book says here. Because of what the word of the Lord actually says. Not so that you could think I have some special connection with God like Moses did. And that I'm like sitting down and, and having a meeting with God and he's telling me, hey, do you know what Brother Peter really needs? He needs this. You know, you know what Brother Brian needs? You need to tell, you know, like, no. And there's people that do this stuff. And from the pulpit, they'll just be saying, oh, yeah, I got a word from the Lord. And he said, and they just say something completely different than what the scripture says. And you could string people along with that language because people go, go along with it. But that is, that's not right. And, and, you know, hopefully you don't ever go along with stuff like that and prove all things and prove the spirits and try them, whether they be of God. 1 John chapter 4. Now let's get back into the context. I went way longer on this point than I wanted to. Verse number one again. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know we the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Now, a lot to unpack right here, but... Basically, when we see this, this teaching of, hey, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is of God, he's drawing a specific distinction between the believers on Christ and the Jews. The Jews that are saying that Christ has not come. And in the context, you see that because all of 1 John has that thematic distinction of kind of calling out unbelieving Jews that reject Christ and they're not going to teach Christ versus those that are teaching Christ. Now, as Judaism back then had grown and been around for so long that you would have people that call themselves Jews, but they're not really Jews. When Christianity started, right, you're going to have a lot of the people calling themselves Christians are going to be real Christians, right? Because it's like the beginning of the thing. But as time goes on, it gets a lot broader and then you get a lot more false brethren and people who are claiming Christ. So they're going to say these things, but they don't really believe them. Right? And the people who aren't saved, they don't really 
believe that Christ has come in the flesh is of, of God, that he's of God because they'll say things that they don't believe just like people will say, oh yeah, salvation's by grace through faith, but they don't really believe that. And what matters is, is, is the belief in their heart. That's confessing in truth, right? So the confession here, when he's saying, you know, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, it's implying a truthful confession, not a, a, a lying confession, right? I mean, that's, that's just implied here. We have to discern that, that the Bible's not just talking about, yeah, anyone who just says anything, this is the way it is. No, of course not, right? We use our sense. This is, has to be people who are um, absolutely truthful and, and have the Spirit, and they're, they're confessing um, that truth. Um, but then it goes on to say that, hey, look, they're of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. And the they, in the context here again, is the false prophets. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, because they're not of God. They're not of the Spirit. So they're only of the world. And that's why when they speak, the things that they say, hey, the world's going to receive that. The world has no problem with that. And the world's going to hear them. And that's where a lot of the popularity comes from. And that's why when you read about the false prophets all throughout the Old Testament, they were really popular. Popular among the people, popular among the world. And this is why when we see people today that are false prophets, hey, if the world loves a prophet, if the world loves a preacher, then you can just mark that off that that's a false prophet. Seriously. Some people exalt the Billy Grahams of being like, wow, he's like the best Christian of the past few generations. Look at how much he did and how much he was loved by everybody. I mean, when you're getting invited to all the political events, when you're getting put on TV left and right, when you, the, when the only people saying anything against you are the fundamental Baptists, <laughs> but everyone else loves you, yeah, that's a good red flag that, that you've got a false prophet there. Jesus said this in Luke 6, 26. You don't have to turn there. Luke 6, 26 says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. But I thought we want everyone to like us. You could want people to like you, but you have to have the priority on preaching the truth because many people get upset at hearing the truth, right? So your priority can't just be like, well, I just want everyone to like me because if you want everyone to like you, you have to lie to everyone. Because the truth divides. And the only way you get everyone to like you is to just lie to everyone. You can't just lie to one group. You have to lie to everyone. Because you've got opposing groups of people that believe different things. So you've got to be able to tell this to one group and this to that another group and this to another group. And you have to speak real vague to get people to like you. I mean, if I just said some things like, hey, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. <laughs> right? Everyone can pray that prayer and no one's going to get offended and there's no problem there, right? You'd be like, wow, what a great preacher. What a great prayer, you know, whatever. But you're not really saying anything. I mean, yeah, you're saying God's great. Okay, yeah, God is great and we can agree on it and we ought to preach that. But it's like, you, that, if, if that's all that's coming out, yeah, the world can receive that. Every religion can receive that. The atheists are going to be the only ones mad. <laughs> like, that's it. But that's a much smaller percentage. So it's, a, you know, it's just kind of like when, when you're loved by the world, you got a big problem as a prophet especially because you're supposed to be preaching the word of God. The word of God divides. It absolutely divides. The truth is going to divide. See, look, God's word is very clear and just says this is the way things are. This is a sin. This is not a sin. This is righteousness. This is what you ought to be doing. And this is wickedness. And the vast majority of people who are doing wickedly are not going to like that. And then they're not going to like you because you're saying those things out loud. And you can see the people who freak out. They know what the Bible says in many cases, but then they're just going to turn all their rage on you because you're actually saying those things. It's like they want you to believe them, but to believe them in secret. Okay, like, yeah, you can believe whatever you want. Just don't say it. Just don't say anything to me about it. Yeah, because they don't want to hear it. And, but when you actually preach it and speak it, then you're going to have people who don't like you. Jesus said, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. That's exactly how the false prophets were. They received praise of men. 
they were loved by the world. Look at verse number six in 1 John 4. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And going back to, again, in the context, we've only gone six verses into this. People who are saved hear the word of God. Amen. And they're going to be able to discern and hear the preaching of God and, and know like, hey, yeah, this is truth. Right. Right? You're going to be able to recognize that because he said, look, if you're of God, look, we're of God. And he that knoweth God is going to hear us. Right? He's saying, look, we know that we're saved. We know that we're of God. And we're, gonna, we're only preaching truth. And this is the word of God coming forth from the Apostle John. And he's saying, you know what? He that knoweth God heareth us. Because you're going to be able to identify that. But he that is not of God is not going to be able to receive it. They're not going to be able to hear it. Because it's spiritually discerned, as I mentioned before. And this is also how you know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So when you're trying the spirits, right? Just the fact of you being saved is going to help you uh, to know whether or not someone else is saved. This, this is similar, you know, in the context here when we're studying 1 John 4, let's flip back to chapter 2 real quick. Verse 18, the Bible reads, Little children is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So ultimately it becomes evident what people really believe and what they're really about. And he's saying, you know what? There were some false, false brethren. There's these false prophets and they were, they, were, they were with us, but they weren't really of us. They weren't really part of the group. They kind of joined themselves, but then they went out to just make it known that like, yeah, th this isn't what you believe. And he's saying, because if they were of us, they would still be continuing in the, same, in the same doctrine because it's of God. And they just demonstrated how they are not of God. And this isn't talking about people who just backslide and get out of church and, you know, kind of get out of the things of God, so to speak, as far as their day-to-day -day living. This is talking about people who just completely are just teaching something way different, Right? These aren't the little nuances and the little differences. And you see things a little bit this, you know, different this way, a little bit different that way. This is going to be a significant thing. Like the nature of God or the gospel or, you know, some of these really major fundamental truths of the scripture. Like, no, look, that's, that's definitely a cause for separation. And they're just, they're just demonstrating that, like, they were never really of us. And people come out and just denounce. Like if someone were to denounce a deity of Jesus Christ or something that was like a member of our church for years, it's like they never really believed that. They were never of the truth to just come to that, to that uh, conclusion. John 10, 26 says this. And you could turn to John 10 if you want. This, this falls in line with the teaching in 1 John 4, 6 that says that he that knoweth God heareth us and he that is not of God heareth not us. John 10, 26, Jesus said, but ye believe... But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. We know the voice of Jesus. We know the voice of the shepherd because we are born again. We are born of God. So you can discern these things and know these things. Go up to verse number two in that same chapter. Jesus said, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, so he, excuse me, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This is a truth of people who are saved that know that you can discern at least on some level, like I know the voice of Christ and I know when things are of Christ and when they're not. I, when, when that, like, man, you start to hear things, you're like, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't, you know, and, and nothing's lining up and it's not matching up with scripture. You know, God's given that to his believers through the spirit Amen. to be able to discern these things and, and to help us to identify when things 
are off. And he's saying, you're not going to go and just follow some other shepherd. Right? And, and that's, you know, you can't take this passage and nitpick all the smallest things and be like, well, then why do people believe different about this or that? This is talking about following the shepherd versus following another shepherd. Right? That's, that's what it, I mean, this is, this is the high, higher level type of an application of looking at this going like, yeah, they're not going to go now all of a sudden follow some other antichrist or, some, you know, not some other antichrist, some antichrist. You know, follow some other person who's calling themselves Christ. That's what I meant to say. Someone who's, you know, not of God. They're, you know, they're not going to do that. Someone who's saved is not going to do that. And this is why people bring up these hypotheticals of like, well, what if someone believes and they're saved, but then they become a Hindu or something. It's like, well, that's never going to happen. It's just not going to happen. That case never exists. What you have is people who might claim to be Christian and claim to have a belief, but, but it wasn't truthful and it wasn't in their heart and they're not born again, that then just follow and, and turn to some other religion. I mean, I can tell you this for a fact right now, I will never have any other God than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's just never going to happen. Now, I might, I might step down from pastoring. I might get out of church completely. I might live a worldly lifestyle. I don't know, right? Like, that's not what I'm planning on doing. But it, no matter what, if, if all of those things still happen, I'm never going to just be like, you know what? Now I'm an atheist or now I'm, I'm a Muslim or now, you know, like that's never, ever, ever going to happen. Amen. It's never going to happen. And, and, and for me, living in the world, it's already been tested because I was completely in the world after I got saved. And I still knew who my Savior was. Even if it was not serving him, not doing anything for him, I already knew that, right? And everyone who's born of God is the same way. And I can say that because of what the Bible says here. I know my own experience, and I don't know your own experience, but I know this is that the Bible says, Jesus said, look, you're not going to hear the voice of strangers. You're not going to follow a stranger. And I know where the, where the Bible says in 1 John 4, Hey, he that knoweth God heareth us, he that is not as God heareth not us. You hear the truth, you can recognize the truth, you can respond to the word of God when you're saved. Let's go back to 1 John 4, verse 7 reads, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And, and we're going to get into this. I know I'm running long already this morning. I'm going to get a little bit more into the love of God in chapter five also, um, because it's, it's, it's relevant there uh, to, to get this whole thing in context. But just to answer real quickly, you know, the Bible says that God is love. And, and lately in our modern time, this gets, this has been used quite a bit to try to support wickedness and, and all manner of filth and, and vile behavior where people will say that, you know, love is love. Yeah, okay, love is love, but perversion is not love. Love is love, but abomination is not love, right? Love is love, and you know what? The Bible tells us what love is. People say, well, loving God and God is love. You don't know God. Look, we do know God, but you know what? The Bible also says our God is a consuming fire. It says that God is love, which is absolutely true, but it also says that our God is a consuming fire, which is also absolutely true. Amen. We don't have a single faceted God. God doesn't have just one face, right? He's, he's, he's a multi-complex being, God, right, that can have love and wrath simultaneously and has so much love, more love than anyone in the entire world can have, which is... Is a, is a defining aspect that God is love while at the same time have judgment, have wrath, right? Uh, God is love, so God has mercy, God has long-suffering, God has all these great attributes, but God also has wrath. And they are not contradictory one to the other. God is love. And, and you know what? That's also why there is judgment, because God is love. And God, for, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's a, that's a high level of love. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So everyone has the opportunity. Yeah, God loves everybody. He loved everyone. For God so loved the world. 
He made that sacrifice and that payment. So here you go. But he's not going to continue to just love everyone all the time. Otherwise, hell wouldn't be a real thing. Amen. And this is the argument that Jehovah's Witnesses will make and other people will say is that, well, hey, how can a loving God cast people into hell? How, how is that possible? Well, because it's a, it's a righteous judgment of God Amen. and God didn't promise to love everyone all the time, no matter what. He loved them and gave them the opportunity to get saved for free. Yep. Right? Now, after they make their choice and their decision on that, it's on them. And, and think about the justice of that and the, the, the justice of God then casting people into hell when he did everything for that person to be able to be saved. Amen. He made the sacrifice. He didn't require work. He didn't require effort. He didn't require anything of them to be saved. Just put your trust in Jesus. Amen. Just believe it. Just believe what I did for you. Just make that one recognition, right? From your heart, say, you know what? Thank you, God. I'm, I'm going I'm to accept that gift. That's all you had to do. That's it. That's all you have to do. So when people just utterly reject that yeah it's righteous for God to then have anger when it's like well look look at what I did for you and you're just completely rejecting that it's a slap in the face you know, you're spitting on the, the, the sacrifice that was made for you that was made for you individually specifically every person that sacrifice was made for you and just to reject that, yeah, that God, God, makes God angry. Because what else could God do? And then what would be the point then if, if, like, if you don't accept God's mercy, God's grace, how is it loving that, well, just no matter what anyone does at all or any belief or anything, just by virtue of being a created being, everyone just goes to heaven? That makes no sense whatsoever. No matter how much sin, no matter, you know, like, but you just all are going to, like, it's, it's fine. Because all you're doing then is saying it's fine. Then what's the point of the law? What would, what would be the point of doing anything or having any laws or having any structure? What, what would be the point? At that point, if, if everyone just automatically just always saved no matter what, just no matter what, I mean, no belief, nothing, just, no, nope. it doesn't matter, then, then life becomes also kind of meaningless too, <laughs> right? And what's the point of it? Laws, what's the point of any? What's the point of reading the, you know, what's the point of it all? We all just end up in the same place because God's love. No, that's not the right God. That's a false God. That's a figment of your imagination. And that's people who just only care maybe about themselves or so self-centered or only care about their wickedness. It's just like, look, and I'm not saying you have to Repent of your sins to be saved because that's also not true, but you have to acknowledge what God did for you and accept Christ as your Savior to receive that free gift. And I'll, we'll get into more about the, the everyone that loveth is born of God and he that loveth not knoweth not God. I'm going to get into that next week. Um, let's keep reading here. Verse number nine. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation means just the payment, right? He's the one that, that paid for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought, we ought also to love one another. So, the definition of love here, because it says God is love, and then it continues on to say, well, hey, herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So in the context here of God being love, it's talking about Christ paying for our sins. That was the ultimate expression of God's love. It's not talking about some, like I said, some weird vile, physical relationship between people doing abominable acts, that's not love. Love is God 
paying the price for your sins. That's love. Love is an ultimate self-sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of a father giving his son. It's a sacrifice of the son giving himself. Amen. Sacrifice. No benefit to you, benefit to others. How does committing abominable acts fall under, the, under, under love of being anything self-sacrificing or, you know, like, it's, it's not. It's only about gratifying flesh perversely. That's all that is. That's not love. Love is loving. How do you, how do you say, like, if you say you love someone, I mean, just think about it. If you say, hey, I love you, those words are empty unless what? Unless you actually do something about it, right? There has to be some action associated with that. And what's going to be love? It's not going to be violating somebody. Love is going to be helping somebody, doing something for them. That's how you demonstrate your love. God demonstrated that love perfectly through the sacrifice of Christ. That's the demonstration. That's the proof. The proof is right there. God loves you. It's, it's not just words. God is love because he made the ultimate sacrifice. And there it was, laid out for the whole world. Here in his love, not that we, it's not that we loved God. He loved us. The only reason we can love God is because he loved us first. And it says, look, if God so loved us, if that's how God loved us, we ought to, to love one another that way too. That's the love that we ought to have. Verse 12, no man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And again, another um, proof for ourselves to know that we're saved and to know that we dwell in him and he in us. Why? Because he's given us of his spirit. That's just another confirmation of your own salvation. Not for anyone to see outwardly. That's an inward thing. He's given of you of your spirit. And the Holy Spirit resides within you. So that is a way to, for you to know and to be comforted that, hey, we know we dwell in him. I know I'm saved. Why? Because he's given us of his spirit. Uh, you don't have to turn. I'm going to read this for you, Romans 8, because I know I'm, I'm almost out of time here. Romans 8, 14, the Bible says, For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to, to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with them, that we may be also glorified together. So God's Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God, that we're saved. It's exactly what's being taught here in 1 John chapter 4. Let's keep reading here, verse number 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Calvinist, yes, the savior of the world. The whole world, he sent him to be the savior of the world. Now, the whole world doesn't get saved, but he sent him to be the savior of the world. He sent him to pay for the sins of the whole world, which is what he did when he died on the cross. But the payment doesn't get applied to those who don't believe. Verse 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And this is like similar to what we see in, in uh, Acts 8, 2 with, the, with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch when he's preaching the gospel to him and how he understands that the eunuch is saved. He says, well, hey, well, here's water. What does it mean to be baptized? He says, if you believe with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Right? So that was his answer to him. Like, no, look, I believe in Christ. I believe that he's the son of God. I believe he's the Christ. <laughs> And that was enough for him to then baptize him to just show that this is what he believes, so he's saved. Just like the Bible says here, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not 
made perfect in love. Now, I believe there's a couple of applications of this right here. Um, but what I want to focus on is just think about this verse this way. It says there's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. I would say, first of all, that none of us have perfect love. We don't have a perfect love. We can have love of God for sure, right? And we can love the brethren, but it's not perfect, which is, which is why we still need to have a fear of the Lord. If we had a perfect love of God, what that means is that we would be following everything that he said all the time, right? Because we'd have that perfect love. We, we would love him, obey his commandments, and do as he said out of respect, out of love. We love God and we would do those things. But because it's not perfect, we have to fear because there is a penalty, there's a punishment, there's a chastisement that we need to expect from our Heavenly Father when we break his commands, when we break his rules, when we're not obeying him, right? So perfect love, there's zero reason to fear. We're doing everything right, and we know, we know God's judgment, we know God's holy, we know God's not going to do anything other than what he said. He's not going to go out of bounds. So if I could do absolutely everything right, I have nothing to fear at all, ever. Nothing. But that would be a perfect love. But because, no, we do, you know, we do fail, we do fall short. I don't have the perfect love of God. Sometimes I don't love God when, for example, if I love something of the world. Hey, love of the Father is not in you. We already saw that in, in 1 John 3. And, and we see these, these, these other things that happen. Hey, if, there's, if, if I'm going the wrong direction, doing the wrong thing, not obeying the commandments, yeah, I can't say that I just have the love of God all the time in my heart. But perfect love casteth out fear. Fear at torment. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? So, and you know, let that sink in too. And this, you know, you better not be hating your brother in your heart. Because if you are, you're not loving God. You say, but I love God, I just don't like that guy. <laughs> it's okay to not like him, but you better not hate him. Right? You say, I love God, but I hate that guy. And as a brother in Christ, no. You don't love God, then you're a liar. Because if you love God, you would love the brethren and all the other sinners that Christ died for. You have to love them. Because you know what? God loves you, even though you're not perfect. And he's never going to utterly remove his loving kindness from you either. And we ought to have that same love for the brethren. So if you love God, if you're going to say you love God, then you're going to love your brother also. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. And again, chapter 5 continues down this same thought in the same path. So we'll get a little bit more in depth. I wanted to cover a lot about the false prophet today, but we'll get more into a lot of the, the love teaching next week. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for uh, giving us this great truth from your word. There's so much, so much doctrine, so much uh, knowledge packed into these verses here. I pray that you please continue to open up our eyes, our understanding to the truth and, and help us just to continue to understand more and more and more about you, about, about how we ought to be living and about the truth in general. Lord, bless the church, bless the people, bless uh, the, the service today and the soul winning this afternoon. And, and Lord, help us to, to serve you more, more fully, more properly, more perfectly. Help us to grow in our love. And um, God, we're, we're, we're here to serve you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.